This is my 2016 Mercedes V-Class, and over the years I've driven all sorts, from supercars through to the Fiat Panda. I'm just gonna fall off. And with all that temptation, I'm going to explain why I chose this Mercedes V-Class as my daily driver. At the end of last year, I paid just shy of 35 grand for this, but there's one thing about owning this car that winds me up endlessly, and it's when people say, nice van, mate. Now, this isn't a van, this is a car. That's a van. A van has loads of space with cargo rails and straps to tie things down. They have loads of ugly, unpainted plastic parts. They have hard plastic surfaces. They have dashboards with lots of binnacles and storage so you can throw all your junk whilst you're out working. They have little empty plastic buttons which remind you of what you didn't spec when you bought this van new. They have ugly cloth seats that can't be adjusted. But the V-Class doesn't have all of this vanness. It has painted bumpers, it has leather seats, it has cruise control, climate control, buttons that work. It's not a van. Well, maybe it is a van. I know it's built on a Mercedes Vito, but it's a car. Trust me. Joking aside, there is no getting away from the fact that the Mercedes V-Class looks like a Mercedes Vito. Although, there are a number of things that make the V-Class identifiable and, in all honesty, better looking than the van variant. My V-Class is the extra long wheelbase with a 2.1 litre diesel engine with 163 brake and it's the Bluetech Sport, packing a massive <laughs> 163 horsepower. There is a 250 variant which obviously has stronger performance and in all honesty is the engine I wanted, but I'll explain why I didn't go for that later on. I've got to admit, the drive isn't revolutionary and the looks and appeal of the car are mild at best, but to fully understand where I'm coming from, I need to tell you a little bit about my car owning history. The very first brand new car that I owned was a Vauxhall Astra Sport Hatch, and as an 18 year old new driver, it did feel very sporty. It was only the second car that I'd ever driven, the first being my dad's Vauxhall Corsa, and I used to love this car. The only problem with it was, is that the boot was really, really small, and it only had two doors, so it just wasn't very practical. So I replaced the Astra with another Vauxhall, a Vauxhall Zafira, but an SRI version, so it looked a little bit mean. And to make it look even better, I replaced the grille with an aftermarket one, so it did look incredibly cool. Most of all, it had loads of space. It had seven seats, so I could cart my friends round. I could lay all the seats flat, and I could put all my gear in the back, and it was incredible. It was such a good car. I loved it, but then it broke. So I decided to go with a German brand, a brand that's synonymous with reliability, with engineering, engines that run for a million miles, BMW. In my early 20s, I was rocking around in a BMW 730D, which admittedly is an old man's car and I don't play golf, but it was super comfortable and I loved it. It had a big enough boot for all my camera gear, it had super, super comfortable seats and a lovely drive for all the long trips I had to do, and it left a bit of an impression. After the BMW broke, I decided to go with a British brand. Engines that would run for a million miles. Bodywork that never corrodes. So I went for an Aston Martin DB9, which is a fantastic car and it's super, super fun to drive. That is for about four and a half days until you realise that this car is about as practical as a chocolate teapot. So I decided to stick with the British brands and go for this, a Land Rover Defender. You can't get much more British than this and it's a true icon and it's incredibly practical. But after about six days, the intercooler broke and then the car got stolen. I wanted a car that was comfortable, something that you could take on a few hundred mile journey and get out of and not feel as though you've been on a ramble in the woods. Something with luxury leather covered steering wheels, sat nav, heated seats, air conditioning, a good sound system. Something that's refined. I love the Defender but it's a bugger of a ride. I just want to glide along in comfort. I don't want 500 brake horsepower, I've got the Aston Martin for that and that is fun but it's just not very practical and I want the practicality. I'm not too fussed about the power in all honesty, maybe I'm getting old. This car has got space, I can put people in the back. I can have people in the back whilst I've got equipment in the boots so I can use it for work, I can use it for leisure. It ticks so many boxes. 
I want to be able to pull up to a job and not be judged by the car that you drive. When you pull up in the Aston Martin, people assume that you're charging too much for your services. Maybe they're right. If you pull up in the Defender, people assume that you're a drug dealer. You pull up in the BMW and people think that you're driving your dad's car. But pull up in this, the Mercedes V-Class, and people think that you're completely normal. They don't realise that you're a crazed car fanatic and you've got a garage full of beasts. There is an AMG version of the V-Class which gives you a slightly sportier front and rear end, but to the untrained eye it's quite hard to spot the difference between the AMG and the Sports. I've got the 360 degree cameras which are fantastic for parking this big square box and of a night these LED headlamps are great, they seem to peer around the corner when you're driving. The flank is pretty standard, it's big and square, and sat on these 19 inch rims. Any concerns that you may have about your V-Class looking too much like a Vito are reduced ever so slightly. There's a split tailgate which is incredibly useful. The small hatch can be opened quite easily and is great for loading any light objects in or out or for quick access. Whilst at the push of a button, the entire tailgate opens. And I know this is nothing new, a lot of cars have this, but it's really, really handy, especially for what we use the car for. I've got six seats and a table set up in the back of this car at the moment, and even with them in position, I've got enough space in the boot for all of my camera gear. And with the squareness of the car, it's so easy to stack and load items, so it's great for what we use it for. There's also a really useful 12 volt adapter here for added practicality. And being the geek that I am, I've even created my own umbrella holder. Once in the back of this car, you can see why it's a favourite in the executive hire market. It's very comfortable and there's plenty of space. I've opted for this table, which has meant I've lost the sixth seat in the back of here, but I love the practicality of this. I love being able to pull up at the side of the road and send an email or do some video editing or photo editing. It's really, really good. Plus, on long journeys, it's great to be able to pull over and have a picnic in the back of the car. There are these buttons which open these windows, allowing air into the back for passengers on long trips, which is great. Everybody has their own handle, a reading light and an air vent for the independent climate control, which is located up on the ceiling. The seats and table are all on a rail system, so to push them forward and backwards is quite easy, although to take them out of the car is a little bit more of a faff and ideally requires two people. The reason I ended up with the 220 Sport over the preferred 250 AMG was as stupid as it sounds for this dashboard. I absolutely love this ebony effect wood dash and because I was buying used, I had to search high and low for a car in the wheelbase that I wanted with this dashboard. Now I also wanted the table in the back and I know that's something that I could have added aftermarket but I just didn't really want all the hassle of doing it. So when this car came on the market with this dashboard and with that table, I was more than happy to sacrifice all the additions that AMG AMG brings for these two things that I really wanted. I had the command navigation, which basically means I've got a bigger screen and a fancy sat nav, but I was really keen on having this size screen because the smaller screen that comes with the same generation of V-Class, I feel is a little bit outdated because it's so small, it's got a really big bezel around the edge. So I was very pleased to get this dashboard and this screen. It really complements each other. The controls for the screen are here. We've got the traditional dial that you can twist and turn and then we have this touch sensitive pad which you can draw on and swipe across which is quite intuitive and once you get used to it quite easy to use. The controls are well laid out and there's a button for everything you would need there to be a button for. There's dual zone climate control so the passenger and the driver can control their temperature independently quite easily. There's the agility control button here which you've got three settings and you can slip this into sport mode and the V-Class feels like a McLaren on the road. It's really fantastic. That's a complete lie, it doesn't feel any different. The two rear doors can be operated electronically by the push of a button which is very useful. Although I feel as though there should be a third button below it to operate the tailgate which there isn't. To open the tailgate you have to get out of the car and go and push the actual button on the tailgate or take the key out of the ignition and push the button on the key. First world problems, I know, but it would be nice to have that button, please, Mercedes. I've never had a favourite button in a car before. All switch gear is relatively similar, but I love adjusting the volume on the stereo by the central dial. Of course, I've got the steering wheel mounted controls, which is much easier to use because they're right where your thumbs are, but I never use them because I get so much satisfaction by using this volume control. I feel as though the position of it and the ease of use to find when you're driving just reminds you of using a DJ deck. And I love turning the radio up with it. One of the most important things in the car is how comfortable it is to drive, and the V-Class is very comfortable. The seat is great, you're quite high because of the nature of the car. Plus, the armrest and the door cards really do 
create quite a cosy chair to sit in. I must admit, after driving this for a couple of hundred miles, I just don't feel tired. I can get out and I don't feel stiff. I can get straight back in and crack on with the journey. It really is a comfortable place to be. There's flappy paddles on the steering wheel, which I must admit I've never used, but they're there if you want to. I love the simplicity of Mercedes cruise control. It's either on or off, whereas in a lot of cars, you have to push multiple different buttons on the steering wheel to activate the cruise control. And for me, this works really, really well. The one thing that I don't like about this car, and it's really petty, is the electronic parking brake. In my mind, the handbrake is on when you pull the button up, and it's off when you push the button in. However, in this car, it's the other way around, and that confuses me every time I turn this car on. There's plenty of storage up front. Below the centre console, we've got two cup holders and a big storage bin. There's a large glove box. There's a funky little space for your sunglasses. Oops along with very large side bins and other little pockets in the door cards. I've got heated seats, which is great for the winter, but these seats aren't electronically operated. You can spec the car to have electronically operated seats, but this one doesn't. I owned a Mercedes Vito for about eight or nine years, and during that time, I must have put about 150,000 miles on it. I must say, it's one of the best vehicles I've ever owned. The van was a 1.9 Sport Edition, and it had six seats, so it was super practical, and it was ultra-reliable. It never really cost me much money to keep on the road, but when it was coming to the end of the life, I was almost convinced I'd buy another one because it was so good and it ticks so many boxes. But I've always fancied a V-Class, but I was never convinced that the extra money for a V-Class was worth it. Considering I have a Sprinter for all my van needs now, a V-Class was a real consideration. And the moment you step behind the wheel, it's clear that it is more than a van. It is much more luxurious, it's much more comfortable to drive, it's a lot quieter. I don't feel as though I'm driving a van in the V-Class. Sure, it is a big two-ton box on wheels and it doesn't handle like an executive saloon. But with the adaptive dampeners which adjust to the road, it's not a bad drive. For my daily driver, I'm willing to sacrifice ride, performance and handling for everything that the V-Class has to offer. This van-shaped car has so much to offer when it comes to practicality and it ticks so many boxes for me. I know I'm lucky enough to have a second car that I can go out at the weekend and drive for a little bit of fun, but if I had to choose one, I would go for a V-Class because you get so much more out of a vehicle than you do with something like an Aston Martin, which is fun to drive, but you just can't use it every day. Last year I was in America and I spent quite a lot of time with Cadillac Escalades and Chevrolet Suburbans. Now those things are awesome and they've got most of the things I'd want in a daily driver, but they are huge and they're not really available in the UK, whereas the V-Class is, and it's kind of in a category of its own here. Sure, there's the VW options, but they're not quite as executive as what Mercedes has to offer. And that's why I've chosen the V-Class as my daily driver. It ticks so many boxes, it's so practical, it can be used for work, it can be used for leisure and that is why I love this car. If you've enjoyed this review then please like and subscribe to the channel and keep watching for more content but for now it's time to crack on with the edits.